Do you ever think of yourself as a pilgrim? Now, if you're old enough, like me, you may have been forced at some point in time to put on one of those goofy black suits or dresses with the big white bibs and shoes with buckles on them to portray some role in a Thanksgiving drama. But other than that, if you had to answer the question, are you a pilgrim, how would you answer? Do you feel settled, established, comfortable? Or is there still something unsettled, not established, something uncomfortable about where you are that draws you forward, a yearning for something more, a sense in which you confess along with the band U2 that you still haven't found what you're looking for? Well, while the former state of being settled and established seems awfully alluring, I think it's the purpose of literary works like Paul Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress and C.S. Lewis's Pilgrim's Recess, along with the scripture texts like ours this morning to remind us that as people of faith, we are on a journey, on a pilgrimage, on the way, in the process of becoming, both as individuals and as a church. Now, this does not mean that we have no security. It does not mean that in faith there is no rest for our weary souls. There most certainly is. But that security, that rest, is found within the arms of God along the way. As we follow a God who is constantly out in front of us saying, follow me. It is in this light that I want us to spend some time this morning, three days after our Independence Day celebration, considering the concept from our Deuteronomy text about what it means to be, as a, be a citizen of a land and yet to still live as aliens, pilgrims in that land. And I think that such a study is especially appropriate for us here in the United States because this is an image that has fit religion here in America from its very beginning. It's been part of what has made religion in this nation vital and dynamic. Its ability to move, to change, for adherents of one creed to accept those who claim another creed or no creed at all. It's been part of what has made us strong. To understand what the writers of Deuteronomy meant by this phrase, I think we have to understand a little bit of the context of that book. Deuteronomy was written later than the events it describes. It was not written by a bunch of pilgrim Hebrews making their way out of Egypt as some sort of historical journal. But much later, by an established Jewish community for the purpose of remembrance and revival. It was a book that was written to excite Israel about the God that they serve and the community that they are. It calls the people of Israel to remember who God is. That God is a great God, the Almighty, the God above all other gods and all people. I think this is one way of saying that God is not a tribal God. That God is not a party God. And by that, I don't mean a kick-up-your-heels party. I mean political party or any other group with an agenda. God is not a God who is on our side and not on their side. The text goes on to remind us some other things about this God. Remember that this is the God who brought you up out of slavery from Egypt. We didn't get here on our own. Also remember that this God doesn't take a bribe. This God won't be used or manipulated. This God will not play favorites of one child over against another. This God is no respecter of persons. The children of Israel are God's children, yes, but they have many other siblings dwelling in many other lands. And God loves all of God's children. And aren't we glad about that? And this brings us to the second emphasis of Deuteronomy. The people of Israel were to remember who they were as pilgrims, strangers, aliens, even if they can now call it their own land. 
I think it's really difficult for us, as it was for those in King David's court when Deuteronomy was most likely written, both established respected members of the religious majority of our culture to see ourselves as pilgrims. But I would submit to you that there is great power in seeing the world through a pilgrim lens, power to free them and us from much of what binds us. First off, this pilgrim paradigm tells us that we are a people of high enterprise. Pilgrims are not the same thing as tourists just there to see how things are going on. Pilgrims are no leisure trippers. Pilgrims have fire in their eyes. They are headed for a destination. It's going the way of God and choosing to do that the way that God does it. It's following the leadership of the Holy Spirit, not presuming you know where to go. Secondly, pilgrims are following a God who is constantly active, constantly on the move, seeking to make us better and our world better. Thus, a pilgrim paradigm tells us that we should never quite settle in, never quite become status quo insecure, never accept the title or role of the established and the ethic of privilege that comes with it, but rather keep a loose grip on our life and on our mission. For who knows when the great God of heaven might go across the mountain and bid us to follow? Who knows when being kind and just and loving might require us to do something a little different? Third, as pilgrims, we live in the world as aliens, people without power. I mean, religious people don't need power, at least not in the conventional sense. We don't need the tools of coercion. What would we do with them if we had them? I had a discussion with a pastor friend of mine one time who had a brief argument with one of his associate ministers over some Sunday school teacher not wanting to teach the lessons as they had been prescribed. Now, mind you, they weren't going to teach something way out of bounds, but this nonetheless troubled this associate minister And so he came to my friend and says, but what if they teach something we don't want them to teach? And my friend said, well, I guess we could ask them not to teach next year. But in the church of Jesus Christ, we do not have have the power to hit you over the head. People of godly religion don't use sticks. And I say to my friend, amen. Amen. As pilgrims and aliens, we don't have that sort of power. What kind of power do we have? We have the power of truth and persuasion and love and charity and justice. Powers against which there is no such law to control. Those are the tools that a pilgrim chooses to use. Lastly, this pilgrim model teaches us that we are dependent upon grace. You know, it's not as popular as it once was, but back when I graduated from college, I had several friends who did backpacking trips across Europe. I've had children in congregations I've served done, do the very same thing. And you know what I used to pray for them? I prayed that they would encounter people of grace along the journey. People in France who would say, come have supper with us. People in Germany who might say, here's a little water for the Germany. People in Austria who might say, here's a little something to get you to the hostel. You hear echoes of that principle in the Gospel of Mark reading, do you not? Where Jesus says, don't take extra bag or food. So do you see how important grace is if you are a pilgrim? You are thoroughly dependent upon it. Indeed, on a fundamental level, even your freedom to follow your dream and embark on this journey is dependent upon another's freedom to gracefully grant you that opportunity. Yes, pilgrims understand that they are dependent upon the graciousness of others. You don't come in as one and say, I demand supper. You certainly don't say, you have to do it my way. You say instead, 
thank you very much. Your hospitality is overwhelming. That's what it is to live as a pilgrim. To know that if it weren't for the grace of God and the grace of other people, one would be lost. In fact, that's what a pilgrim is without grace. A pilgrim without grace is lost. Yes, there is inherent in the idea of a pilgrim a very real sense of humility. In part because most pilgrims don't most pilgrims understand that they haven't always been right. I mean, the children of Israel took a few wrong turns along the way to get across that desert, both geographically and theologically. And the same is true for us, right? Thus, yet another reason that pilgrims don't insist on their own way, but rather choose an ethic of love and grace toward those like them, and those not like them. Well, I've said all that probably too much to say this. If we, like the first readers of Deuteronomy, remember who God is, that God is not our God, our possession, that God is not a tribal God, a respecter of persons or churches or faiths or parties, and if we remember who we are, that we were and still are very much pilgrims, aliens even in our own land, then how can we not come to an ethic of compassion for other aliens and pilgrims among us and a firm belief and protection of religious liberty and freedom and the separation of church and state? And we do this not only because this is ethically and morally right, but because it's also theologically correct. What my friend said about godly people not using sticks is right because God does not use sticks. And Jesus did not use sticks in our text in Nazareth, now did he? And in our text from Mark, he goes on to instruct us not to use sticks either. No, God does not ever force God's self upon anyone. God does not manipulate faith out of us. God offers us presence and relationship and salvation and forgiveness and calling, but we must choose to accept it. To not choose God freely is not to choose God at all or to choose something far less than the great God of creation and the God who expressed himself in the person of Jesus Christ. That's what some of our forefathers and foremothers in this country understood. And by today, here today, I'm not emphasizing those forefathers and foremothers that were Episcopalian and Congregationalist and others who we so often speak of. But today I want to emphasize our Baptists and other free church prophets who spoke spoke out for religious freedom on this soil in the genesis of this nation. You do know that most of the American colonies were settled by folks fleeing the established Church of England in an attempt not to establish religious freedom exactly, but to establish their own church here. That in most colonies you had to belong to the colony church and you were taxed to support that particular church. The Episcopal Church here in Virginia, the Catholic Church in Maryland, Quakers in Pennsylvania, Congregationalists in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And if you dared to claim or start another church or refuse to pay the church tax, you were persecuted. But Baptists and other free church people continued to speak out for religious freedom in spite of this persecution. People like Roger Williams, who was run out of Massachusetts into then the swamps of Rhode Island to form a colony based on religious freedom. People like Ann Hutchison, who felt called to preach and teach, even as a woman in that day and time, who was forced to the frontier, where she was eventually killed along with her children. 
People like Isaac Backus, who over 40 years logged 918 journeys on his 1,200-mile preaching circuit for the cause of Christ from 1747 to 1806, trying, among other things, to get the government of Massachusetts to stop and repeal the religious tax. And then, of course, people like John Leland and the Baptist and Free Church people of Virginia who lobbied Madison and Jefferson to make the First Amendment, the First Amendment of our Constitution. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Friends, I don't know about you, but if I'm going to be a Baptist, I'm going to be a Roger Williams, Ann Hutchison, Isaac Backus, John Leland type of Baptist who refuses to hide in the sheep's clothing of faith and is yet somehow on the inside an authoritarian who would push religion on anyone and everyone. Not me, and I hope not this church either. So let me ask you, Where are we on the principle of religious freedom in 2024? Do you think it's a live issue or one that was put to bed back in the colonial days? You've been reading, listening, sourcing the same news that I've been attuned to? Renewed regulations to display the Ten Commandments in public spaces? Which version? Who knows? The Bible being taught for literary and his, not for literary and historical reasons, but for religious ones in public schools. The repeated efforts to cut investments in our public schools to create or increase school vouchers for private religious education. The banning of books because they offend someone's religious sensibilities. Not to mention the marginalizing of parts of our population because their very existence offends some religious sensibilities. No, I don't think the battle is over. Indeed, I think 248 years after independence, religious liberty is in danger even in our day. And not so much from a state that wants to control the church, but from a church that is seeking to use, at very least, if not control, the state. And if our Baptist and free church mamas and daddies taught us anything. They taught us to run and hide from that as if it were the plague. That Christian nationalism of any sort, regardless of the era, is at its essence neither very Christian nor the type of nationalism that any citizen of this country at least should ever be a part of. My dear friends, I want to say to you that we don't have to go that way. That we are better than that. That we don't have to stoop to those means that are better ways to love our country and our fellow citizens than that. I want to say to you that we are rather a people of a high and holy enterprise, a people of a high heritage of the freedom of religion, and that this is a Baptist principle, maybe our main gift to this whole American experiment, and that this is a principle deep in our American heritage, no matter of creed or denomination. But most of all, it is a principle inherent inherent in our pilgrim identity of those who follow a God who calls us to be not only tolerant but compassionate toward other aliens and pilgrims. Even those not like us, even those who do not confess our faith or any faith. For we were and still are very much so Aliens too, fellow pilgrims on a journey, 
those who are still on their way, those who still don't have it all figured out, those who are still searching, along with our Jewish forefather Abraham, as the book of Hebrews reminds us, for that eternal city whose foundation and architect is God and God alone. May God have mercy on us if we ever, ever settle for a lesser vision.